chapter 16, and we found out in the Greek, that's the spirit of Pythonos, the spirit of Python. That the devil comes at us like a snake. Mainly he comes to bite, to poison. He likes it when he gets his venom in us, and we get all venomous and bitter and annoyed and poisoned. That's the devil's normal attack. But we found out that tree of life, which are good for that, man. We're too smart for that. We don't fall for that. We walk in love. We forgive. And so the devil then comes at us like another kind of snake, a python, which doesn't bite, doesn't poison, it suffocates, it crushes. And, you know, God gave me that as a prophetic word when I was in America. And when I came back and preached it, I've never seen a response to a word like that. So many people came forward. They feel like they're being crushed by the devil. And we saw beautifully, people beautifully set free. Then we talked, the next week, we talked about atmosphere. We talked about the fact that praise creates an atmosphere, and that scares the devil off. The devil has no power, no strength. When we praise God and magnify God, that brings the right atmosphere. And the Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people, and we found out that means God sits down and rests when we praise him. Isn't that beautiful? And then last week, we looked at, you know, just closing the door to the snakes, making sure the chicken coop had no holes in it so the snakes couldn't get in. So where are we going to go for our last week on this? Well, I found out something. Pythons lay more eggs than any other snake. Pythons can lay a hundred eggs at a time. Not under sure we don't keep them and use them to, you know, you know, have a scrambled python egg in the morning. But what a python does is, because they're, they're not warm-blooded animals, they're cold-blooded animals, is if the eggs get cold, they die. And so the python lays this massive batch of eggs, normally 60, 70, sometimes up to 100. And then the python coils herself, my python, coils herself round the eggs to keep them warm. And what she does is she actually shakes to keep the eggs warm at the right temperature. Because if they're not at the right temperature, they won't hatch. If they're cold, they will die. And so what the devil is doing right now to some people is he wants to choke you. He wants to steal your breath, steal your growth. And so he's laid some eggs in your mind. He's laid some eggs in your mind, in your thought life, in your soul. And now he's warming those eggs to make sure they hatch. The battle for your soul, the, the, what, what we call spiritual warfare, it's not big angels and big demons over the sky fighting with swords and shields and whatever else. Spiritual warfare, the battle for the soul, is what you think. It's whether you let the python lay her eggs in your ears or not. Through your eyes and ears, the devil lays eggs in your mind thoughts, and then he warms them until they hatch, and when they hatch, they produce evil life suffocation. James 1 talks about that. Desire gives birth to sin. Sin gives birth to death. And we've all experienced that in our life. We've had a thought that we shouldn't have had, but we incubated the thought. We kept it going over, and eventually that thought gave birth to something we didn't want to give birth to. And the problem is we try and stop the problem on the giving birth end. You can't do that. You know, once you're pregnant, and that pregnancy goes full term, there's nothing you can do to stop the fact you will give birth. If you want to not give birth, you have to go back to the conception phase and make sure that's what you stop. And if you don't want to give birth to death in your life, if you don't want to give birth to problems and to negativity and to grief, then you have to stop it at the conception phase. You have to stop conceiving these ideas of death and letting the devil sow death into your mind. Are you with me here? So I want to help you protect your mind. In Luke 4, the devil comes at Jesus, if you're the son of God, if you're the son of God. What's he trying to do? He's trying to lay his eggs in Jesus' mind. And Jesus resists him. How? With the word of God. The word of God always beats the thoughts of the devil. And Jesus beat him so soundly. If you read Mark 4, uh, Luke 4, sorry, Luke 4, 13, it says this. 
it says, and the devil left Jesus looking for a better opportunity. Now, you see, the devil learned something that day as he couldn't approach Jesus directly. And actually, from that point on, the devil never speaks to Jesus directly again. You can live your life, the devil never speaks to you again. Amen. Amazing how many Christians, oh, the devil's been really hassling me this week. Why? You, you can live your life, you can shut him up with the word of God, he never hassles you again. Now, the devil didn't stop plotting around Jesus, but what did he do? He, he went and found him. Jesus' mum. Ever had that happen? Yeah. Mum turns up at the church meeting. And you stop making a fool of yourself, embarrassing yourself while he's preaching stuff, Junior. Jesus said, who's my mother? Who's my brothers? I want to do the will of God. Amen. The devil then found his way into Peter. You, you don't want to die, Jesus. You don't, want to go, you don't want to be a fanatic about this religion stuff, Jesus. You don't want to go to the cross, right, you know. Some of the stuff you're doing, you're really helping people, making a difference in people's lives, Jesus, but you don't die from this. And Jesus said, Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're not thinking God thoughts, you're thinking man thoughts. And when we think man thoughts, by the way, we're being a mouthpiece of Satan. And so we need to think God thoughts, and we need to not let man thoughts into our mind. We need to be radical people. We need to be on fire people. We need to be people who dream big. Life is not about doing what everyone else is doing. It's about doing the right thing. And too many Christians are toying with temptation and playing with the snake eggs and warming the snake eggs. Well, I'll just have a little go in my imagination of what it's like if I had a relationship with that married co-worker. You're warming the eggs. Whosoever look at her woman with lust in her commits adultery in his heart. That's just a thought. I'm not hurting anyone. No, you're incubating the eggs. Something's going to hatch. Even Job knew this before he didn't even have a Bible. I made a covenant of my eyes not to look lustfully at a woman. Your life will always move in the, do in the direction of your dominant thoughts. The images you have in your imagination today will become the actions you walk out tomorrow. It's a great principle for walking in destiny, but the python is stealing it, laying eggs in your mind, subsuming it, and if you let him do that, you're in trouble. And I'll tell you what, this nation, the United Kingdom, is moving away from God at a startling speed. If you got someone who lived 30, 40 years ago, and we suddenly teleported, you know, I mean, Back to the Future Day was last week, wasn't it? The guy went 30 years into the future, 2015. Honestly, if you took someone from 1985, and put them in 2015, the biggest shock to them wouldn't be how many varieties of Pepsi are available. It wouldn't be what the shoes can do. The greatest shock to them would be the change in morality, the change in culture, in terms of how we're now far more anti-God, far more that they would sit down and watch TV and wouldn't know what was going on. They'd say, how on earth are people watching something so lewd, so iniquitous, so ungodly? Well, the reason they're watching that on the TV is they're warming the eggs. But if you don't incubate the eggs, if the python can't incubate the eggs, all the eggs die. If the eggs get cold, they die. If you stop warming them over in your mind, they die. Those thoughts die. Those lusts die. Those temptations die. Now, why are we in Ezekiel 8? Strange place to start. Let's start reading from verse 6. Actually, let's start verse 5. Then the Lord said to me, Son of man, look towards the north. And I looked, and there towards the north, beside the entrance to the gate near the altar, stood the idol that made the Lord so jealous. God has taken Ezekiel into his temple. Ezekiel is a prophet. Ezekiel wasn't supposed to go to the temple. That was what the priests were. The priests went to the temple. But God said, Ezekiel, I want you to see something in the temple. And there in the temple was an idol. Can you imagine? An idol in the middle of God's temple. I mean, this is the Jewish people here. Commandment number right, no, 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 no. Worship no idols. And they build an idol, not just on the top of a hill, but they build it in the middle of the temple. That's crazy. That's really crazy. And here they have this idol. The Son of Man, do you see what they're doing? Do you see the detestable sins the people of Israel are committing to drive me from my temple? But come, we'll see something even more detestable than these. 
What is more detestable to God than idolatry? What is God getting upset about that's more detestable to him than idolatry? He brought me through the door of the temple courtyard and I could see a hole in the wall. So I dug into the wall and found a hidden door. Secrets in the temple. Whenever something's secret, you know something's wrong. Listen to me, ladies. If he wants to be your boyfriend but doesn't want to tell anyone, there's a problem. There is a problem. Warning. Alert. Alert. Listen to me. Someone wants to have a meeting. Just a few of the Christians from the church. Just some of the important people like you. And nobody else knows about it, and I don't know about it. Warning. Secret things going on. Always trouble. But come, you'll see more, more detestable sins than these. He brought me to the door of the tour, and I see a hole in the wall. He said to me, now, the son of man, dig into the wall, so I dug the wall, found a hidden door. He go in and see the wicked and detestable sins they're committing in there. I went in, I saw the walls engraved. So they've written on the walls of the temple. They've taken, you know, pen, ink, permanent marker. They've written on the walls of the temple, crawling animals and detestable creatures. I also saw different idols. And the word there, the Hebrew word there, is, is actually, it's, it's actually a Hebrew swear word. No, no, wait. Equivalent to our word dung. Can I say crap in the pulpit? Is that what? It's probably stronger than that. I don't want to go any further than that. But what it means is idols in sexually compromising positions. They've taken the walls of the temple and drawn gods having sex on the walls of the Jewish temple. That's what they've done. Seventy leaders of Israel were standing with Jazaniah, son of Shaphan, in the center. Each of them held an incense burner. A cloud of incense rose above their heads. And the Lord said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the leaders are doing with their idols in the dark? They are saying the Lord has not seen us. But he has. The leaders of the temple were in the temple looking at images of people having sex. They have put up pornographic wallpaper in God's temple. They're there to be worshipping God, but it's gone unclean. Lewd pictures of false gods having sex, beasts having sex. And God says, I am seeing what's going on, even though it's in the dark. God loves you. Let me tell you that. Let's build that foundation on that. This is love. Not that we love God, but he loves us. First John 14. God loves you. But if you are involved in pornography today... What you're doing is self-destructive. You're laying eggs in your head for the devil. And we live in a world submerged in pornography, a tide of impurity, and all of it comes from the python, and it chokes the life out of you. Let me give you some numbers. Right now, this second, Sunday morning, 30,000 people in the UK are online looking at pornography. 35% of everything downloaded on the internet is porn. 25% of everything typed into Google is pornographic in nature. One third of those types into Google are women. Teenagers allowed to watch what they want on the TV are more than three times as likely to end up pregnant or getting something. There is a direct correlation, a one-to-one -one correlation between teenage pornography use and teenage depression. 47% of families in the UK say pornography is a problem in their family. That's causing their family to be worse off than what it should be. That's nearly half. 56% of all divorces filed in this country refer to pornography. 68% of divorces in this country filed refer to Facebook. Seven out of ten divorces involve Facebook. Nothing against Facebook. We have a great ministry on Facebook. We are really helping people on Facebook. 
We spend a lot of money every month on boosting posts and getting the word of God out there. But people are meeting people they used to know online. People are using Facebook to do things they shouldn't do. And it's breaking up marriages. 28% of work computers in this country have been used to look at porn for an average of 90 minutes a month. I didn't even start getting into the maths of what that's actually costing the economy. You need to understand something here today. That you were created by God with a very powerful imagination. Every one of us is a visual being. God created us to be visual. Your eyes receive 4 million bytes of data every second. It enters your eyes at the speed of light. You can't get any faster than that. 187 miles per second, 4 million bits of data, boom, straight into your face. When we speak, when I speak to you, your mind immediately converts those words into pictures. So when I say apple, you don't see apple, uh, uh, uh. you see an apple, bright red apple, moldy apple. The words I use create a picture in your mind. We are created to be image, to have an imagination. If I say dog, you see a dog. Now look at Matthew 6 with me. Matthew chapter 6. That's why if you read the book before you see the film, you don't like the actor because he's not what you imagined him to look like. That picture of what the actor looked like only existed in your head. But that image is so powerful, it causes you to look at the film and go, that they got it wrong. <laughs> We're visual beings. Matthew 6, this is Jesus preaching, Jesus talking. Your eye, verse 22, Matthew 6, 22. Your eye is a lamp that provides light for your body. That's how powerful your eye is. When your eye is good, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is bad, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep the darkness? The eyes of many are being polluted in our generation. Your eye is the place light enters, but if you corrupt the eye, everything in your life will end up corrupted. You'll end up doing things you never dreamed you could do. Some of you think you're hiding it, but the effects are not going to be hidden. And some of the eggs that you're keeping warm, some of the eggs you're incubating will hatch. That's why we're preaching this today, because we're going to let those eggs go cold and die. We have to wake up and do it now. This is a destiny message as much as anything I've preached this year. Because you won't be able to walk into your destiny, you won't be able to dream big, because your mind's on other things. You're thinking about it. You're playing sexual imagery over and over again in the comfort of your own home, incubating it, hatching it. And you know, you don't even need to watch porn now to watch porn, you just need to watch TV. Yeah. There's a series came on iPlayer, I can't remember the name of it. And Amanda said, that looks quite good, that series. Have you watched it? I said, I'm not even gonna try watching it. I said, it just looks to me like it's gonna be sexually immoral. Just had that feel about it. So I'm not going to start watching it, man. So I'm going to watch an episode. Next day, I said, how was that for you? She says, don't watch it. There's no need. Oh, I'll just cover my eyes up at the naughty bits. Come on now, let's stop deluding ourselves. We're filling, we're filling our mind with stuff. We shouldn't be. TV shows are filled with unmarried couples in and out of bed with each other. Movies mocking the Lord, mocking family values. We're called to renew our minds by watching the TV and the internet and re-olding them bring them backwards, conforming us to the well. Listen to me, the python is real. He wants to lay eggs in your mind and in the minds of your children. When my children are spirit-filled, I bring them to church every week. That's awesome. My children are spirit-filled, I bring them to church every week. That's not enough. Best place for them. Absolutely the best place for them. The devil hates your children. He hates you. He wants to poison your children's minds. So do you know what your children watch? Do you know what song lyrics they're listening to? Are the eggs in your children's mind? Are your, are your teenagers thinking, I wonder what it would be like to smoke? I wonder what it would be like to have sex outside of marriage? I wonder what it would be like to take drugs? It's amazing me recently, the amount of Christians who are 
struggling with, with drug addiction, cigarettes, cannabis, struggling with addictions. We have dominion over the plants, people. They shouldn't be lord of you. One of the most dangerous eggs to teenagers, certainly, is intellectualism. It's cool now not to know anything. It's cool now to doubt everything. You know, it's cool to always be questioning, where does that come from, if you are the son of God? Has God really said? You know, no, you need an it is written in your life. You need to know, this is the word of God. I'm not playing games with this. This is the Bible. This is God's word, and I believe it. Doubt your doubts, feed your faith. Evolution is one of the biggest steak eggs to sow doubt in your mind. What does evolution teach? It teaches man has no special identity. Mm -hmm. I was listening to a program on Radio 4 the other day. Oh, that made me sound intellectual, didn't it? <laughs> Radio 4. And um, that, that there's two ethicists on talking about animal rights. And they were basically saying that we can only eat animals that aren't self-aware. <laughs> and so, the, the presenter's going, well, which animals are self-aware? How do you know which animals are self-aware? And they said, well, it's a thin line. We have to draw it with a pencil, but you, know, you can't eat pigs. They're self-aware. It's okay to eat mosquitoes. They're not self-aware. And they had this whole thing. And then they decided it was okay to eat baby pigs because baby pigs weren't self-aware. I'm not sure if baby pigs are tastier than full-grown pigs. I don't know. But they had this whole thing going on. And then, then eventually, the interviewer finally, after about 40 minutes, I was listening to the whole thing, because I wanted to see if he'd asked the question, which to me was the common sense question, is it okay to eat baby humans? Because babies aren't very self-aware. And they, they stumbled over answering that. You know you've got a professor of ethics at Harvard University right now who thinks it's wrong to murder chickens, but believes abortion should be an option up until the age of two. They banned him from Germany. They wouldn't let him speak in Germany. Because the Germans know all that kind of stuff, where that ends up. This is the world we live in. And the eggs are the ideas that, you know, we came from pond scum. If I came from scum, might as well act like scum. No, you were fearfully and wonderfully made by genius. You were crafted. You were beautifully made. You are designed by God who loves you. You have a purpose. You have a destiny. You know, how someone can actually believe in evolution is beyond me. In the beginning was nothing. Then it exploded. And all of its explosion became the most complex and amazing machines ever known to man. Goo became a fish that grew legs and fur and started eating leaves. And then the tail grew so to climb the trees to eat more leaves. Then the tail fell off and the fur fell off and it became your great grandma. <laughs> when I used to teach creation evolution at school, you're allowed to teach it only in the religion classrooms, not in science classrooms, bizarrely, even though evolution is a system of faith. But when I used to teach creation evolution in schools, I would say, I've invented a new machine, guys. It's amazing, this machine. It's going to solve world hunger, my new machine. It produces a pellet every day which you can eat and it's really tasty. You can cook it a hundred different ways, it's really tasty, you can mix it with other foods, it's full of protein, it's really good for you. And every day this machine will produce a new food pellet for you. I said, now, if you get tired or if you need more machines, then what will happen is you take one of the food pellets and it'll actually become another machine that produces more food pellets. You just take the food pellet, leave it, and it'll become another machine that produces more food pellets. I says, and if you really get tired, you can actually take the whole machine, roast it, and eat it. It's really quite tasty. I said, I've solved Rod Holmes. You can't. No one can invent that. You have to be an absolute genius to invent that. And I'd let them play out and let the class tell me, you need an absolute genius to invent that. And I'd press a button, and a big picture of a chicken would appear on the whiteboard. You need to be a genius to invent a chicken. Chickens didn't come about by chance processes. Chickens are genius invention. Man. It lays a food pellet, you eat the food, and you can have that, it grows into another chicken. You can, it's amazing, and if you get tired, you can roast the chicken, eat the chicken, man, it's finger licking good. <laughs> it's amazing. And it's all healthy food as well, it's not processed, it's not, you know, chemicals, it's amazing. We've got celebrities now making all these religions look cool. And all this Buddhism and Kabbalah and all that stuff, making it all look cool. Let no one take you captive through false philosophy. 
All of this going on is to keep you from your destiny. The python wants to choke you. But God wants to get you operating in maximum capacity. God wants you operating, and he wants to do more, exceedingly abundantly more than you can ask or dream. Whatever your wildest dreams are, God wants you to live above them. But some of you, your life... It should be magnetized towards that direction, running you towards that direction. But what you've done is so many negative thoughts, so many sexually impure thoughts, so many difficult thoughts, so many thoughts, and they are pulling you in every other direction and pulling you off the track of your destiny. God's here today to help you. If God is your partner, how big can you dream? Man, let's never dream small again. Let's turn to Mark 5. I don't think anyone in this room is at the stage of Mark 5. I don't think you'd have made it through today's worship if you were. But this guy was totally choked by the devil. This guy is the worst case scenario. You can't find a worse case of demonization of being choked by the devil than the guy in Mark 5. And so we're going to see that Jesus Christ came and set him free. So if Jesus set him free, and he's the worst case, guess what? Jesus can set you free. And I believe that before this service finishes today, some of you are going to have your Mark 5 experience. Some of you are going to be clothed in your right mind like you've never been before. Some of you are going to be able to think and dream. Some of you, that fog of confusion that Joel's talked about at the beginning of the service, is going to go and it's going to be gone forever. Something awesome is about to happen right now. You're in the right place at the right time. Let's read Mark 5. So they arrived at the other side of the lake in the region of the Gadarenes. Let's do a little bit of thinking here. The region of the Gadarenes. So there's the Gadarenes. What do we know about the Gadarenes? We know it's on the other side of the lake. Yeah? Jesus had to cross over to get there. It's not on the same side as everywhere else. You with me? What else do we know about the Gadarenes? Well, it was named after one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Any guesses to which one? Gad. Gad, fantastic. What do we know about Gad? This is history lessons from Exodus today. The tribe of Gad, the tribe of Reuben, and half of Manasseh asked Moses a very unusual request. They said, Moses, we don't want to live in the Promised Land. Do you remember this? Yeah. I didn't make it up. It's in the Bible, I promise. They said, we don't want to go and live in the promised land. What did we know about the promised land? We knew it was where God wanted them to live. We knew it was God's will. We knew it was a land flowing with milk and honey. We knew it was houses they never built. We knew it was vineyards they never sowed. Man, that's an awesome place. Yeah. I'd like some harvest I never sowed for. i like houses. Z -z 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 -z. My property portfolio in the promised land, flowing with milk and honey, cholesterol and sugar, but that's okay. <laughs> it's a land of abundance. And there's the Gads going, hey guys, and you know what it said? You know why they want to stay on this side of the, the lake, on this side of the river? Do you know why they want to stay? It said the grass is good for our sheep. You've got to choose here between houses and vineyards and flow with milk and honey and nice grass for my sheep. What is wrong with you? Are you crazy? <clears throat> nice grass for the sheep. But actually the choice they made is nice grass for the sheep, which I can see, compared to houses and vineyards and milk and honey, and all the promises of God, which I've only got his promise for. Yeah. And a lot of us have chosen the grass we can see yeah. over the promise. Mm. And so now Jesus comes where? To the land of the Gadarenes. The land of the carnal people the land of the people who said, you know what, we'll all just stay here. Ever felt like that? Ever been the gathering? And gave up milk, honey, houses and vineyards for nice sheep grass. There's a lot of Christians living at the border. They trust what's right in front of them over God's promises, even though God's promises are far better. 
We've come this far, God. But we're not going to become fanatics for this thing. Yeah, I'll be here Sunday morning, sometimes, mainly. Every other Sunday, when it's not snowing, raining, foggy, cold, wet. Don't expect me to turn up and hand out leaflets on the streets. I'm going to stay on the border while you guys enjoy your promises. A lot of people get saved, reach the edge of the promise of God, and then compromise and camp on the compromise. And a lot of people like that, what happens? They stay in the same place for years. Years and years. You've settled for what you see. You've trusted your wisdom and your plans. You're camping on the borderline, and you're living so far from what God's promise wants to manifest in your life. Worship God from the borderline. You go to church, why? Because you go to church. Don't dare raise your hands. Don't dare dance. Don't dare shout. Well, if someone hears me, turn up at half past ten. Leave God here when you rush out as soon as you can, as soon as the service finishes. In your spirit, you have all the fire and love and glory of God. But you don't let it shape your soul. You don't let it impact your thoughts. You never think like God. You never act like God. You never love like God. You never show kindness like God. Here's my word to you today. It's time for us to cross over. And what were the people doing in gatherings? Raising pigs. Pigs, man. How, 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 how far from the promise of God have the Jews got to be that they've become pig farmers? How many animals could they have chosen from? What do the pigs represent here? They represent living unclean. Some of us today, what I've said today, you're living unclean because you haven't crossed over. Today we become fanatics. Today we cross over. But here's the goodness. Oh, here's the beautiful thing. Jesus came over to the Gadarenes. Jesus didn't stay over here and go, I'll only minister to the guys who are on fire. If you want to get with the program, get with the program. No, Jesus came over here. Oh, I don't know how backslidden you are today. I don't know how are you doing that you shouldn't be. I don't know why God's led me to preach this message today. But here's the good news. Jesus will come to you no matter what a mess you're in. Even if you're farming pigs, he's still coming to visit you today. Oh, he's here for you today. Oh, isn't this awesome? And when he came out of the ship, verse 3, 2, verse 2, when he came out of the ship, immediately the man out of the tombs, the man with an unclean spirit. Today, in this message, this man is my representative of all the borderline people. You see, the only reason the devil is impacting your life, the only reason he's afflicting you is because you're living on the border. Yeah. You had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with torture chains. Where did he go when he became inflicted by the devil because he wouldn't cross over. He didn't cross over. The devil started to afflict him. He wasn't where he should be. The devil started to afflict him. So he went and hung out with dead things. Yeah. Yeah. This is where Christians go when they don't catch fire. Well, I just went to a seance. It was okay. Well, I just got my palm read and I just got my fortune. Um, I just watched Celebrity Ghost Hunter and bought a lottery ticket. I've just come back from seeing that Twilight movie and now I'm going home to watch The Walking Dead. <laughs> Surrounded by dead things. The pigs are all around. These teenagers are listening to pig music. He's watching pig TV. Oh, this episode has such and such in it. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, I'll just fast forward the nudity. You're making friends with the pigs. You're letting the snakes in. Sorry to change animals mid-sermon, but it just worked better that way. And then you get your family together to pray, and you, your kids don't want to pray. And suddenly we live in a city where children attack and kill each other just to join a gang. A man found a sick snake. He took it in, he nursed it back to health. He loved the snake because his pet spent a lot of time with the snake, fed the snake. One day he was feeding the snake and it bit him. And it poisoned him and it killed him. 
As you lay there dying, he said to the snake, I brought you into my house, I loved you, I cared for you, I treated you, I kept you safe. And the snake said, you're stupid. So I'll put a bit more snake in there, shall we? <laughs> You knew I was a snake all along. And that's how many of us are living our lives. You're doing things that are stupid. And you know it's a snake all along. Giving the snake safe harbor in your house, pigs in the house, sin is fun. Hebrews 11 says sin is pleasurable. You don't have to go and experiment and prove that in the Bible. You just believe it. But it will kill you. The wages of sin is death. So he goes to dead things, and he'd been bound with fetters and chains, and chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. What was he? Out of control, violent, scared people, beat his wife, gang violence, human trafficking. They bound him, but it didn't work. Why didn't it work? Why couldn't they put this guy in chains? Why can't the psychiatrist help? Why can't the politicians do something about knife crime in the city? Why can't people change what's going on? Because demons are real. It's not like TV. You can't wriggle your nose and make them disappear. And if you got that reference, you can't. Or showing your age. <laughs> it's not like TV. It's a spiritual issue, it needs a spiritual solution. It needs Jesus. Jesus is the solution. Look what happens next, verse 6, I love this, but, but. Now I don't think anyone tears so bad they literally hang out in cemeteries and rip chains apart. But some of you are struggling, some of you are feeling dead, feeling dead. And here's the good news, but when he saw Jesus afar off, but Jesus. Jesus wasn't even close, and he knew Jesus was there. You know, if you live on fire, demons get uncomfortable just because you walk past. You know, that time you went to Tesco's to shop, and someone snarled and swore at you, and you thought, jeepers, what was that? Just you making the devil inside them uncomfortable. Just reacting to all the love and grace inside you. You ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice, and said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus? Thou son of the most high God, I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. The demon's actually speaking out of the man's voice now, I and mean, that's staggering. I've seen that a few times in my life, and I want to see it again, but I'm quite prepared to see it again. I'm quite prepared to cast out demons wherever they can. And Jesus said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is your name? Let me just cover here. I'm just going to take a little sidebar for a second. Just anyone here who's, you know, and we should all cast out devils. In my name, you cast out devils. One of the things that went around for a long time when it came to people casting out devils was asking the devil their name. What's your name? What's your name? That's where it comes from. You know? And so we had this theology that you couldn't cast out a devil unless you knew his name. Well, first of all, let's just stop for a second. This is the only time Jesus asked the name. And so what was he asking the name of? He said, come out of him, devil. He wasn't asking the name of the devil. He expected the devil to come out. He said, what's your name? In other words, hey, what's your name, dude? He's asking the man his name. Man. Because he's Jesus. And he wants to know who he is. Man. And he wants to minister life and love to him. He wasn't trying to find out the devil's name. Man. But he found out this man didn't have one devil, he had several devils. And so there's still some devils inside him, and the devils are still speaking. Jesus wasn't Jesus then didn't go, Oh, okay, what's all your names? <laughs> You don't need to know the devil's name to cast him out. You don't need to know what your sickness is called to get it. You don't need to know what the problem is called. And so you read some of these books and you have these trees of devil names. You're the devil of nose picking, devil of nail biting, devil. And you think, you guys have got a problem. Just call it devil, cast it out, and move on. And never forget what Jesus didn't forget. If you're not there to cast out devils, you're there to make someone hot. Casting out devils is part and parcel of doing that. And so you say to the person, what is your name? I'm not trying to find out a list of devil's names to give us mystical power over them. We already have all authority and power. That's our sidebar over. 
you don't have to pay for that. And the time is also stopped. And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we're many. Legion is a Roman term meaning an army of 6,000. There may or may not have been 6,000 demons. It is possible they were lying. <laughs> Just a suggestion. And he besought him much that they would not send him away out of the country. Don't make us move, Jesus. Notice the demons all knew who was boss. The boss isn't demons. The boss is Jesus. And Jesus Christ is here today. Amen. And he's the boss. And you're going to be set free. And what was tormenting you when you came into this morning is not going to torment you when you leave today. There was nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. Why was there a great herd of swine feeding? Because they were living on the edge. And the devils begged them, saying, send us into the swine. We want to enter the swine. And forthwith, Jesus gave them leave. Okay, fine. Go to the pigs then. See if I care. Jesus didn't care about the pigs. Now someone gets born again. What am I going to do now? I'm saved. I used to make my money by dealing drugs, by prostitution, by a bit of this and a bit of that. Jesus doesn't care. He just wants you to get rid of what's unclean. He'll provide for you. And he'll do it honestly. Don't stop worrying about the pigs. You worry about the pigs so much. If I get born again, my friends and family aren't going to speak to me again. Don't worry about the pigs. If I get born again, my boyfriend's going to dump me, my girlfriend's going to leave me. Don't worry about the pigs. Some of you in the men's breakfast, some of you guys from the old days, remember when John Hamilton shared his testimony. And there he was in prison. He got saved on the Saturday, baptized in the Holy Spirit on the Sunday, and Monday morning, he went to the police and said, here's all the stuff you haven't caught me for. They put him in jail for four months. And he read his Bible for ten hours a day for four months. And he's reading his Bible, and his Bible says you shouldn't have sex outside of marriage. So he writes a letter to his girlfriend and says, we're not having sex again until we get married. She went back and said, you're done. Forget okay about the pigs. Amen. He, left, he left jail, and God called to go to Bible college. Only knew one Bible college, only one Bible college in Glasgow, so he went to the Bible college and said, oh, I want to go to Bible college. I said, you have no qualifications at all. You can't go to Bible college. He's like, but God told me to go to Bible college. They said, get a C in English, and you go to Bible college. So he went to local high school and said, I would like to do my English qualification, my GCSE English, O-level English, whatever it was at the time. And they said, we can't do that. He said, but I need it to go to Bible college. I said, oh, well, one of our English teachers is a Christian. And maybe she'll help you. And she did. She decided to help him free of charge. And she taught him English, and he got his C for English, and he went to Bible college and married her. <laughs> Forget about the pigs. There's so many things we worry about that are really not worth worrying about. And Jesus gave them leave. Jesus doesn't care about the pigs. And the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. The herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. There were about 2,000. So there's 2,000 pigs. There must be at least 2,000 demons. And were choked in the sea. And demons are dumb, aren't they? If you're in charge of an army of 2,000 pigs, you'd have attacked Jesus, wouldn't you? Oh, what have you done? No, I just run to the sea, man. Hey. Man, we think we've got to be so clever now with the devil. He's really quite dumb. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city. So there's the pig keepers running back. They killed all the pigs. And in the country, and they went out to see what was done. They came to Jesus, and they saw him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed. There's a revelation for you. When you're free from demonic attack, you can sit down and be at peace. People who are aggravated by the devil can't sit down. And also, they're clothed people free from the devil. You know, I'm not saying when someone comes in half naked to church, we go, cover yourself up, lady. You know, I'm not going into clothesline preaching. I've seen all that kind of stuff. I'm not into that. But it's an indicator there's something wrong with the heart attitude. What do we do? We minister life to the heart. We minister freedom to the heart. And eventually, they'll, they'll, they'll dress appropriately because, anyway, that's another aside, I guess. See, then clothes. 
listen to this though, in his right mind. Some of you today, you're going to be in your right mind. You come here confused, tired, weary, hurting yourself, loving dead things that you know you shouldn't. And you're going to leave in your right mind. Jesus has crossed over today to visit us. <coughs> you're going to be free. But when the big people saw it, well, they got scared. The big people got scared. Yeah, they're taking away the pigs. People always get scared when you get free. People always get scared. And, and you all know the ending of the story, you know, and you know the people got upset. They saw a man who could rip apart chains with his bare hands running around the graveyard naked. But then when they saw him sitting down at peace, clothed, happy, they got scared. It's amazing. The carnal man, it's amazing with the carnal man. You know, I've heard testimonies of teenagers, and they'd be, sadly, a typical teenager, getting drunk, sleeping around, smoking, drinking, maybe doing drugs. And a teenager would get beautifully born again. And the same parents have no problem with their 15 year olds sleeping around and doing drugs. Get upset that the same 15 year old is going to church and tithing. You can't give 10% of your mind to God! 10% to cannabis, that's okay. It's crazy. See, people get so upset. <laughs> I had a guy preach, and, 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 and he preached in Dundee, but he was uh, from Edinburgh. And he was the elder of a church of Scotland in a village just outside Edinburgh. And everyone knew he was a town drunk, everyone knew he was a wife beater, but they were quite happy with him being an elder in the church of Scotland. And one night he ended up in a Pentecostal church and got born again. He got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Started speaking in tongues. And stopped drinking. Never drunk again. For the three weeks they kicked him out of the church. We get upset when people are delivered. We get upset when people are free. We get upset. It's crazy, but that's what people are like. Listen to me. Stop waiting for everyone in your life to be happy with the freedom you have. Well, they're never going to be happy. You're going to get more and more in your sound mind, more and more prosperous, more and more blessed, more and more healthy, more and more in your right mind. To be able to sit down, clothed at peace, people aren't going to be happy with you. Don't worry about it, man. Forget about the pigs. I'm going to tell you right now, we're going to play a couple of songs in a second, and I haven't preached this message by chance, what's happening today is not by chance, and it may just be for one person in here, I don't know, but you're going to get set free. Jesus is going to give you self-control over things you haven't been able to control. You're going to leave this place in your right mind. Free from your pornography addiction, free from fear, free from anxiety, free from self-harming, free from violence. You're not going to do things that degrade you and make you feel like dirt again. And I'm telling you, the borderline Christians, the gadabouts, didn't like it. And what? Like it. You killed their pigs. You took the joy out of me watching this nonsense on the town. You've made me feel bad about feeling bad. You know, the pigs would have killed them one day. But Jesus killed the pigs. And they're unhappy with the freedom. There's people in this room right now who, deep down, your thought is, leave my pigs alone. If you choose the pigs, you'll be suffocated one day. You will not enter your destiny. You stop sitting on the edge and cross over. Let's believe big. Let's worship big. Let's worship him freely. I'm telling you, the United Kingdom is a compromised nation. That's why we're seeing what's going on today, because we're all living on the edge of Christianity. It's a Christian nation. No, it's a Gadarene nation. But if we let Jesus kill the pigs, starting here, starting today, the ripples of what happened today, we're going to see a new nation. I believe that this country could be the world leader in missionary work again. I believe that with all my heart. And you might be here today and you feel you're far from God. Jesus is here today to do for you what he did for the gathering man. It's going to happen today. And here's the good news for us in this new covenant, in this new age of grace. It's not Jesus coming from the outside to bring you freedom, but it's the Jesus inside you.
to go and bring you that freedom. Right now, I cancel the devil's assignment over your life. I cancel his influence over your family. The devil is trying to choke you, but right now, Jesus inside you is breathing out of you. The devil's assignment over Tree of Life Church, Dagnum, and Tree of Life Network is cancelled. His desire to choke us and stop us growing and stop us achieving the church we're dreaming of is over right now. I'm telling you, money's going to come to you just because of today. I cancel all fear in this place. You're not going to leave here worried about the devil. I know I've preached about the devil the last few weeks, but it's not in a way that's going to make you pace the floor, scared of death and poverty and loss and sickness and failure. It's the word, church people. Our weapons are not carnal. But what we bind today on earth is what will, what is bound in heaven. And it will stay bound. There's more power in the name of Jesus than anything the devil has done, could do, will ever do. He's the king of all kings. He's the lord of all lords. And he's here right now to set you free. This guy, a minimum of 2,000 demons, maybe 6,000. This guy was more messed up spiritually than anybody else in the Bible. Jesus turns up and with a word Jesus sets him free and in under 10 minutes he's gone from being the most demonized person we've ever met in the Bible to sitting down resting clothed in his right mind free free from all those voices on the inside free from all that worry, all that anxiety, all that pain, all that guilt, all that shame. Free from his desire. In fact, let's just, let's just read this. Eighteen. Five eighteen. As Jesus was getting in the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. But Jesus said, no, go home to your family. Oh, man. And tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he's been. Now, now, here's the thing. I don't know if anyone in the Bible has done this, apart from this man. But Jesus gave this man a mission field. All of us have been given a sphere of destiny. What was the mission field this man was given? Your family. Hallelujah. Jesus, well, this guy's just been set free. He, he needs a little mission field. Go tell your family. So the man started off to visit the ten towns of that region. <laughs> Big family. Oh, he was told, go and tell mum and dad, go and tell great auntie Jean. <laughs> he preached in ten different towns. Some of you here today, you see him in the back of your mind, you think this message is for me, I'm the most bound person in this group. You're going to preach in towns, you're going to preach in cities, you're going to preach in nations. We got to proclaim the great things Jesus has done for them, and everyone was amazed what he told them, I'm telling you. It's your day. I don't know who this message is for. I know it's for us as corporate. It's helped everyone in the room to some measure. But I know there's specific people battling with specific things today. I know there's people in this room struggling with pornography today. I know today is your day of freedom. I know there's at least one person in this room struggling with a desire for self harm. Jesus is here today. I know some of you are worried, anxious involved in a relationship you don't know how to get out of. I know Jesus is here today. Now, I don't want to embarrass anyone or break anyone's dignity, so rather than asking those people to stand up and us sitting down and wondering what's wrong with them, I'm going to ask everyone just to stand up so we can all have a chance to respond. Just stand to our feet right now.